Good morning. I'd like to uh, call everybody's attention. We've got a, a uh, special speaker this morning that will be teaching the Bible class and then also bring us a sermon this morning. Uh, this is Bob Turner from Virginia Beach, Virginia, working through Lubbock, our Sunset School of Preaching in Lubbock. Uh, he was with us, the leadership group, yesterday. Uh, we had an all-day seminar with him, and uh, he's going to uh, be bringing us the service this morning. I want you to welcome him and uh, get acquainted with him afterwards. He is going to be leaving pretty quickly. We've got to get him to the airport because he's speaking in Lubbock tonight, so he's on a fast schedule. But, Bob. Well, good morning. I want to start this morning by asking two questions, and I'm going to need your help in answering both of them, okay? First question is very simple. Of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which one is your favorite? The second question is why? So, which Gospel is your favorite Gospel to read and why? Now, you can't say all four. I get a lot of people who want to do that. They're like, well, I like all four of them. And, well, I like all four of them, too. And I'm going to share with you why I like all four of them in just a moment. <laughs> but for now, which gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, really is your favorite to read? And why is it your favorite? Okay, John, because of the love. Ooh, Luke, because of the perspective. Now, don't tell me John is your favorite because your name is John. Which one? Saint Luke. Why? Why Luke? Okay. While you're looking, I'm going to see if anybody else. I knew you was going to say John. <laughs> Why Matthew? Matthew uh, really gave such a great statement and then it seems so Okay. Very good. Matthew's Jewish perspective. I like that. Who else? What's your favorite gospel? Why? Yes. Okay, very good. Like the narrative of Matthew. Don't be shy. What's your favorite gospel? Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John? And why is this your favorite? Yes. Okay. Ah, very good. John, because you relate. It relates to you. Preparing a way of salvation. Like that. Very good. Anyone else? Yes. Yeah, the investigation stuff. Yeah, very good. And you know, it's funny, I, I rarely get this many Lukes. And when I ask that question, it's pretty rare I get that many people who say they like Luke, but I love the perspective y'all are coming up with. Anyone else? What's your favorite gospel? And why is it your favorite? 
I asked this question one time to a small group I was studying with, and they said, one guy in the group said, Isaiah. I said, that's not an option. <laughs> so, <laughs> now, Isaiah's not on the list. Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Well, I'll tell you, at the first of the, first of the year, I did a survey. And I sent out an email to a lot of different people, and I asked them, what is your favorite gospel, and why is it your favorite? And, and it was very interesting, the results that I got from that. Does anyone want to guess which one came back as the favorite? I mean, the most? John. John was the favorite. Six to one. Six to one people preferred the gospel of John. And I got a lot of different reasons as to why, which I thought were very good. Some that have already been expressed because of the personal aspect, the love, the showing the deity of Jesus in the gospel of John. I mean, John really does want us to see Jesus differently, to see him as not just the Son of God, but that he is God in the flesh. And I'll tell you, when I read through the Gospel of John, I really do like it, but for a lot of different reasons. I like John because uh, of this, this idea of the way that we see Jesus. It's like Jesus is trying to get people to see him differently. I mean, even when you look at the first few uh, disciples that John points to Jesus and says, Behold, I want you to see the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And these two disciples start going after Jesus. And Jesus turns and he asks, What do you seek? And they say, Rabbi, where are you staying? And he says, Come and see. And then you have Philip and Nathaniel. And Philip goes to Nathaniel and says, I want you to, we found the Messiah, the Jesus of Nazareth. And Nathaniel's like, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And Philip says, come and see. <laughs> I just love that. And then, then when you get to chapter 4, you have the Samaritan woman. And that whole discussion is to try to help this woman see him differently. Because when Jesus first encounters her, what happens is he asks for a drink of water. And she's like, how is it that you, being a Jew would ask me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink. I mean, that was just unheard of, first of all, because as John tells us there, the Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. Plus, he crossed this gender barrier or talking to a woman, which was something that was not common. And so we have all of these things going on, and I love the statement that Jesus makes to her when he says, if you knew the gift of God. Isn't that a powerful thought? If you knew the gift of God, you would ask him for a drink, and he would give you living water. And she's like, sir, the well is deep. You have nothing to draw with. Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well? So she's beginning to see him a little differently because first it was just as an ordinary Jew. Now she's beginning to wonder, are you greater than our father Jacob? And he says, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I give them will never thirst. And she's like, sir, give me of this water. I mean, wouldn't you be the same way? I know I would. I'd be like, yes, I want that water so that I can drink from that and never be thirsty again. If you knew how much water I literally drink every day, you could understand why I would love that. And he says, go call your husband. <laughs> Wouldn't you love to have seen her face when she says, I have no husband? And Jesus said, you're right. You've had five husbands, and the one you're with now is not your husband. <laughs> Can you imagine the look on her face? But notice how she's beginning to see him differently because now she says, sir, I perceive you are a prophet. So they get into this discussion about worship, which we tend to focus on a great deal. And then, as you continue to read through that text, she, goes, she says, I know that when the Messiah comes, he's going to reveal to us all things. And one of only two times, Jesus specifically says, I am he. I am the one. So she leaves her pot, and she goes to her people, and she says, Come and see a man who told me all things about myself. This is not the Christ, is it? 
And I mean, you just see the progression. It was an ordinary Jew. And then is it, are you greater than our father Jacob? You're a prophet. And now it's, he's the Messiah, the Christ we've been waiting on. John wants us to see him differently. And perhaps my favorite in the gospel of John is with Thomas. Do you remember after Jesus appears to the apostles and they go and they tell Thomas that he has risen and, and he says, unless I see the nail prints in his hand and put my fist into his side, I will not believe. And Jesus appears and he says, Thomas, do not be unbelieving, but believe here. And Thomas is the first to acknowledge Jesus as God. My Lord and my God. Isn't that awesome? I love John. I love John because of that reason. Uh, the second gospel that came in as the favorite was Matthew. Uh, Matthew, for a lot of the reasons that have been expressed, the narrative, especially the birth narrative that we have, connecting him, the Jewish connection to where Matthew is really addressing a lot of things concerning the Jews. And, and I really do love that too because there's so much there and the thing I love about Matthew is that where John is trying to get us to see Jesus as God in the flesh, Matthew really wants us to see Jesus as the master teacher. In fact, we have five major teaching sections in the Gospel of Matthew, and it's like this cycle. You have the teaching, you have miracles, and then you have followers. And you have teaching, you have miracles, and you have followers. And, and each of these te teaching sections are very unique in and of themselves because you have the greatest sermon ever preached, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. And a lot of people said that they really liked that sermon. And personally, I do too. I have been reading the Sermon on the Mount almost every day for months because I just love to, to see how Jesus deals with so many different aspects of our life. And I think if we would just live by the, the Sermon on the Mount, our world would be a different place. But in chapter 13, we find the second major teaching section. And it's here that Jesus begins to teach in parables. And as the apostles approach Jesus, they're kind of confused with why he's speaking to them in parables. And what Jesus does is he then tells them a quote from the book of Isaiah. That while seeing, they will not see. While hearing, they will not hear and return and that I might heal them. But then Jesus says something to the apostles that I think stands out. And he says, blessed are your eyes. Because they see. And every time I think about that statement, I, I, I ask myself, <laughs> are my eyes blessed because I see? So John wants us to see Jesus as God in the flesh. Matthew wants us to see him as the master teacher. The third gospel that came in in that list was Matthew. Matthew. I'm sorry, it was Mark. <laughs> we did Matthew already. Mark. Mark, I kind of figured Mark would have been the favorite because it's the shortest, <laughs> but that was not the case. But Mark came in as a favorite, and there were a lot of different reasons that were given. The one that stood out to me the most came from a co-worker out at Sunset, and he said that the reason he liked Mar Mark was because it starts with Jesus as an adult. And I never thought about that before. It's a very interesting perspective that Mark really does. He starts with Jesus as an adult and his ministry. And what's interesting about that is when you read through the Gospel of Mark, you're going to see that Mark really does try to help us see that Jesus is superior, that he is above Caesar. He's greater than Caesar as Lord. But there's something very interesting about the Gospel of Mark that Mark wants us to recognize when it comes to Jesus, and that is to see him as the miracle worker. I love the Gospel of Mark because it's perfectly divided in half. In the first eight chapters, you have all of these miracles, and Mark wants us to see Jesus doing these miracles, and there's a key word that's used, and that is immediately. When Jesus did miracles, it didn't take six months for somebody to get well. I mean, it was immediately. In the last half of the book, we only have three miracles, and one of those is the resurrection. So I began to ask, why, what is it that takes place? Why does Mark 
record for us in the first half of this book all of these miracles and in the last half there's a different focus here what what takes place to make this shift so I began to look at chapter 8 it's a very interesting chapter because you have Jesus feeding the 4,000 and then you have this discussion with the Pharisees and then Jesus gets in uh, a boat with the apostles and he tells them beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the, the apostles are like is it because we forgot to bring food? They're concerned as they didn't take food with them on the way. And Jesus is trying to help them understand and, and to see things a bit differently. And then when they get out of the boat, Jesus takes a man who is blind. And he takes him outside the city and he spits on his eyes and he touches him and he asks, what do you see? And he says, I, I see men walking around like trees. And Jesus touches him again. And the text says that then he began to see everything clearly. And I thought, is it because Jesus didn't have the power to heal him completely the first time? What's going on here? <laughs> and then it dawned on me that what, what's taking place is you have this, this challenge on the part of the apostles. They're not seeing things clearly. And that's what Jesus is trying to help them recognize is that they are not seeing him clearly. Because immediately after he heals this blind man, he asks them, who do men say that I am? Some say you're John the Baptist or Elijah, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. But then Jesus asks, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you're the Christ of God. Immediately after this point, once Peter acknowledges that they believe that he is the Christ, Jesus then turns his attention away from the miracles, and now he begins to teach them, I'm going to Jerusalem, I'm going to suffer, and I'm going to die, and I'll be raised on the third day. That's the major turning point in the ministry of Jesus. And Mark helps us to see Jesus as this miracle worker, but also to recognize and to see that he has a purpose in going to Jerusalem, he's going to die, and he's going to be raised from the dead. And I think that's significant. Now, while Luke seemed to be one of the favorites here, or at least among those who spoke up, Luke was the one that was recorded as the fourth favorite of the Gospels in my survey. And <clears throat> I read Luke over and over and over many, many times to try to kind of get some perspective because one of the things that stood out to me about Luke, as was mentioned earlier, was this idea that he really does write from a different perspective. He's really investigating and researching the information and he wants to find out all this stuff. And as I began to read Luke more and more and more, I found some things that are very unique to the Gospel of Luke that you don't find in the other Gospels. Now, I realize that all of them have some unique features to them. But Luke, to me, records for us some of the most unique things about Jesus that we don't have in any other Gospel. But what I noticed that really baffled me when I looked at the Gospel of Luke is that it begins and it ends with doubt. Isn't that interesting? In the very first chapter, you have all this discussion about the birth of John the Baptist. And Zacharias, his father, goes into the temple and my, or Gabriel, the archangel, appears to him and says, your prayers have been heard and your wife is going to bear a son and you will call him John. And Zacharias doubts. And as a result, he's not going to be able to speak until after John is born. And he names him, and you know how that account goes. In the very end of the gospel, in chapter 24, after Jesus has been raised from the dead, and the apostles have been told that he's been raised from the dead, they don't believe it. In fact, when Jesus does appear to them, he asks them, why does doubt fill your hearts? So the gospel begins and it ends with this concept of doubt, and everywhere in between, because of the research and the investigation that Luke does, he's going to record for us everything about the life of Jesus so that it will remove all doubt. And I love that. 
And when you look at the gospel of Luke, some of the most beautiful things that take place begin with the birth of Jesus. Because here you find that Mary and Joseph are going to take him to the temple to circumcise him. And there we're going to learn about Simeon. And Simeon, when he sees Jesus, he's going to pray to the Lord and he's going to say, Let your bondservant depart in peace, for my eyes have seen the salvation of the Lord. Isn't that a powerful thought? Because where they had doubt, both on the beginning and the end of this gospel, because even though they could see it, they doubted. Simeon says, my eyes have seen the salvation of the Lord. And then some of the other unique accounts that we find throughout the gospel of Luke involve either the way that we see Jesus or the way that we see others because of Jesus. I think about when Jesus went to the home of the Pharisee. Simon, do you remember what takes place? There's a woman who has less than a good reputation, and she comes and she begins to weep, wetting the feet of Jesus with her tears and wiping his feet with the hair from her head. And do you remember what Simon is thinking? If this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman this is and wouldn't allow her to touch him. You see, he was looking through a different set of eyes. But Jesus then points out to Simon something that he had never considered. Because Jesus looked at this woman differently. And it makes me wonder, how do we look at people today? When we see people that are of less than a good reputation, how do we see them? Do we see them through the eyes of Simon Or do we see them through the eyes of Jesus? I would hope. I hope we see them through the eyes of Jesus. And then when you continue to read through the Gospel of Luke, you get this account about the Good Samaritan. You remember you have this this religious leader, the lawyer who comes to Jesus and he's wanting to know about what he needs to do to have eternal life. And Jesus tells him, you know the law, keep that. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your might. Love your neighbor as yourself. And the guy wanted to justify himself. And he says, who then is my neighbor? And Jesus tells him this parable about what we refer to as the Good Samaritan. And notice the terminology in this text. Because you have this guy who was going between Jericho and Jerusalem. And he falls into the hands of robbers. They beat him and they leave him for dead. And a certain priest came by and it says when he saw him he passed by on the other side and a certain Levite also happened by that way and when he saw him he passed by on the other side but a certain Samaritan also happened by that way and when he saw the man he felt compassion And he bound up his wounds with oil and wine, and he took him to an inn, and he took care of him. And then Jesus asked this guy, which one of the three proved to be a neighbor? And the guy couldn't even say it. (laughs) He just said, the one who showed mercy. And Jesus said, go and do the same. And again, I begin to wonder, how do we see people in their times of distress Do we see them through the eyes of the priest and the Levite, or do we see them through the eyes of the Samaritan with compassion? And then think about the rich man and Lazarus. The text tells us that Lazarus died, and the angels carried him to Abraham's bosom, and the rich man died, and in torment he lifted his eyes, and he saw Lazarus in Abraham's bosom. And began to plead with Abraham to send Lazarus that he might dip his finger in water to cool his tongue. And you know what stands out to me about that particular text? Is that nowhere does it say that Lazarus saw the rich man. 
I've often heard people talk about heaven and how there will be no tears in heaven. We sing that song, there will be no tears in heaven. But you know the text in Revelation doesn't say there will be no tears in heaven. What it says is God shall wipe away all tears. <laughs> there will probably be some tears, at least at the start. And God has the power to wipe them away. Isn't that a beautiful thought? And then think about Zacchaeus. Here's Zacchaeus. This is another unique account in the Gospel of Luke. And Zacchaeus is the one that he wants to see Jesus. And he can't because he's short. But that doesn't stop him. <laughs> he runs ahead and he crawls up in this sycamore tree because he wants to see Jesus. And whatever it takes, he's going to do that. And it makes me wonder... Am I willing to do whatever it takes to see Jesus? There are so many others, <laughs> so many others in the Gospel of Luke that are so unique. But the one I want us to look at, the time that we have remaining, is in Luke chapter 24. If you have your Bibles or on your iPads or your phones or whatever you have there, <laughs> open up to Luke chapter 24. We're going to look at verses 13 and following down through about verse 35. I'm not going to read the entire text. Uh, but I want to highlight some things from it, so if you want to follow along. It is such a beautiful passage of Scripture, and it's a very unique text because we don't have this account in any of the other Gospels. In Luke chapter 24, beginning in verse 13, we read about two men who are walking on the road to Emmaus. It's a village that's seven miles from Jerusalem. And the text tells us that while they're walking along, they're discussing all of these things that have taken place. Now, what are all these things? I don't know. It may have been that they were talking about the crucifixion. It may have been that they were talking about the women who had been to the tomb and came back and reported that they had seen angels who had said that Jesus was alive. You'll remember in the early part of chapter 24, the angels appeared to them and said, Why do you seek the living among the dead? Because they were going to remind them about how that Jesus had told them that he would be crucified and that he would be raised. And so maybe that's what they were talking about. I don't know. But what I do know is the very next verse says that Jesus himself, <laughs> Jesus himself began walking alongside them. And in verse 16, it tells us that their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. Now, I looked that up. I wanted to know a little bit more about that because... I wondered why. Why were they unable to see Jesus or recognize him, to know him? It wasn't some outside force. It wasn't God who was preventing them. It was something from inside themselves. And so I began to ask the question and to really look more deeply as to what the reason might have been as to why they didn't see Jesus for who he was. My first thought was, well... Maybe it was just a preconceived idea. I mean, it's pretty clear when you look at the text, and you drop down there a little bit, that they're going to specifically say that they had hoped that he would redeem Israel. You see, the Jewish people had this preconceived idea that the Messiah was going to be a strong military leader. And that he was going to come and lead this army against Rome and remove Roman oppression from them. And so when Jesus was crucified, then it's like all of their hope was gone. And as they're revealing to Jesus these things that they had been talking about, then they're going to say, we had hoped that he would redeem Israel. So maybe it was a preconceived idea. I also began to realize that it's perhaps because they misunderstood Scripture. <laughs> I think that one's probably most notable from the text because when you read about the discussion between these two men and Jesus, what happens is that Jesus will begin with Moses and the law and the prophets and explain all things about himself from the Scriptures. There's no doubt they clearly misunderstood what those passages in the Old Testament taught about how that Jesus must suffer and enter into his glory. And then I thought, 
maybe it was just a, it was counterintuitive. You know, it just didn't make sense to them. And I think that's clear as well when you back up really in verses 11 and 12 there because the women are going to come and they're going to report to the apostles that Jesus is raised from the dead, they, that the angels had reported to them that he had been raised from the dead. And the text says that the apostles refused to believe it because it seemed as nonsense to them. That just didn't make sense that someone would be raised from the dead. And so they refused to believe it. And then, as I thought about this text even further, I thought maybe it's just because he was kind of out of context. <laughs> you ever have that kind of thing happen to you? That you look at somebody and you're like, no, I don't recognize you. But it's just out of context. I, I was at the Fried Hardeman lectureship in February this year. And I was walking over to the gym because we had a booth set up there for the, the SALT program. And as I walked up to the door, I'd kind of noticed peripherally that there was a couple that was walking up behind me. And I thought, well, I'm going to do the nice thing. I'll hold the door. And so I opened the door up, and he walked right on through. <laughs> and she stopped. <laughs> and she looked at me. I looked at her. She goes, do you not know me? <laughs> and I got, I, I mean, the minute she said that, I recognized her. I'd known her for years, but it was so out of context. I didn't expect to see her there, and I thought maybe, maybe that's what was happening with these two men. I mean, the last time they saw Jesus, he was on a cross. He'd been crucified, and maybe they didn't recognize him because it was just kind of out of context, you know? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's all of those reasons combined. But then I began to realize, why do people not see Jesus today? I mean, do people not see Jesus today because they have preconceived ideas? I, I know of people that really, they, they became a Christian because they thought that by becoming a Christian, somehow that God or Jesus was going to take care of all of their marital problems. And that by being a Christian, he would remove their financial struggles. Or that he would heal them of their physical infirmities. And then when that didn't happen in their life, they gave up on Jesus. Because they had this preconceived idea as to what Jesus was going to do in their life. And so they were prevented really from seeing him because of that. And then I began to think, well, is it possible that people don't see Jesus today because they misunderstand Scripture? <laughs> That's a big yes. I think there are a lot of people in our world who don't understand Scripture. And because they don't understand what's written in God's Word, they fail to see Jesus. Whether they're seeing Him as God in the flesh or seeing Him as the master teacher or seeing Him as the miracle worker... Or just seeing Jesus in the way that Luke records for us. And then I thought, well, maybe it's counterintuitive. Maybe people don't see Jesus today because it just doesn't make sense. I mean, there are a lot of people that when it comes to this idea of Jesus being God, going to the cross, suffering and being crucified... That doesn't make sense. And then being raised from the dead, why would God go to the cross and die? That doesn't make sense. And so people don't see Jesus because it really seems as nonsense to them. And then, as I've already mentioned, maybe it's out of context. I don't know. I've had that happen to me, and I know you have as well. But then, as I began to realize all of these things, there was something else that came to me. That kind of scared me. And that was this. Do people not see Jesus today? Because of me. Do people not see Jesus because of me? 
my words, my actions, my commitment, my focus, my attitude. You see, the only way that people are going to see Jesus in our world today is through you and me. And I can tell you from a personal perspective, I don't want to be the reason that someone doesn't see him. There are a couple other things here in the text of Luke chapter 24 that I want to point out that I had never seen before. I've read this text so many times, I don't even know how to tell you how many times I've read it. And as I was reading through this text, there was something that stood out to me that I had never seen before. As you look at the discussion that's taking place between these two men and Jesus, when they finally get to Emmaus, Jesus acts as though he's going to go on further And they say to him, no, it's late in the day. Come on in and have something to eat. So Jesus goes in and they sit down and he takes bread and he breaks it and he begins to give it to them. And the text then says, then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. And they looked at each other and they said, were our hearts not burning within us when he was explaining the scriptures to us on the road? (laughs) And they got up that moment and they went back to Jerusalem and they found the eleven and they said to them, Jesus really has risen from the dead and he's appeared to Peter. And they explained to him, explained to the eleven, the things that happened on the road and how that they recognized Jesus in the breaking of the bread. Two thoughts that I want to share with you that to me are the most significant from this entire text. The first is that the first thing these men did when they saw Jesus is they went to tell someone else. When they truly recognized Jesus, when they knew it was him, the first thing they did was they went to tell someone else. In fact, I I believe they ran the seven miles from Emmaus back to Jerusalem. It was too important not to get there and to tell the eleven, Jesus really has risen from the dead. And so the first thing that they wanted to do was go and tell someone else. And I believe that when we see him, it's going to be the same. When we know that it's Jesus and we believe that when doubt no longer fills our hearts, but we believe that we're going to tell someone else because you can't keep that to yourself. It's a, it's a game changer, as they say. I mean, this is about eternity. There's now reason to have hope in a world where there is none. But the second thought that I want to leave with you is where they saw him, where they recognized him. And that was in the breaking of the bread. In the breaking of the bread. Now Luke, who records the gospel of Luke for us, also records the book of Acts. And in the book of Acts, we're going to find this phrase, the breaking of bread, used frequently. And Luke uses it in two different ways. One of which is in the Lord's Supper. I'm not a fan, but I'm going to use it anyway. (laughs) This is not breaking of the bread. Sorry, it's just not. But I am thankful you're not using styrofoam and NyQuil. And so... The idea here is that when we observe this feast, the Lord's Supper as we call it, it's here that we see Jesus. People often ask me, what do you think about? What am I supposed to think about when I'm observing the Lord's Supper? 
We're not doing it yet. Not yet. It's an illustration. But what do you think of? What am I supposed, where's my mind supposed to be? And I tell them, now, this is where we see Jesus. And don't just see him hanging on the cross. Don't just think about his death. But see him as the resurrected Lord. Because that's where our hope lies. That's why we observe this feast. And we are in remembrance of him until he comes. Because of our hope. But there's another way that Luke uses this phrase. And that's in connection to a common fellowship meal. Because the text there in Acts Acts chapter 2 says that every day from house to house, they were taking their meals together, breaking bread. Isn't that interesting? I don't know when... We kind of stopped doing this, or at least not doing it as much, and I know COVID has not helped. But it used to be, when I was growing up, that it was common for Christians to get together on a regular basis to eat a meal together. And I never really knew the significance of that when I was young. And really didn't understand the significance of it until I began to see this chapter in Luke chapter 24 differently. We used to sing a song in the youth group when I was growing up. Have you seen Jesus my Lord? He's here in plain view. Take a look. Open your eyes. He will show it to you. There's a verse in that song that says, Have you ever stood in the family with the Lord there in your midst, seen the face of Christ on each other? Then I say, you've seen Jesus, my Lord. When I first recognized in Luke chapter 24 where they saw Jesus, I started this practice. I don't tell people unless I do this lesson (laughs) because it kind of scary I think but last night James and Susie took me to dinner they had no clue we had a waiter that was a little exuberant and a little over helpful (laughs) and he interrupted more times than not (laughs) but he was trying to be kind and attentive But they didn't know. The whole time, I'm sitting there and I'm listening to James kind of give some history to me about the congregation and and we're talking about things in their life. I'm looking at them and I'm like, I see Jesus in you. Yesterday at lunch, in between the sessions, as I'm sitting there across the table, I'm looking at those that I'm eating with and I'm thinking... I see Jesus in you. To me, the whole significance of why the church assembles and why we need to be together more and not less is because this is when I get a chance to see Jesus. Is I get to see Him in you. And if you want to know the takeaway for this lesson for you, is that as God's people that meet here, You need to spend more time together, whether it's in your homes or at a restaurant or over here in the fellowship hall, whatever it is, you need to spend more time together and start looking for Jesus in each other. Because that's where you're going to see it. I love all four Gospels, and there are a lot of reasons why. I love John because John wants us to see Jesus differently. He wants us to see Jesus as God in the flesh. I love Matthew because I like to think about this concept of blessed are your eyes because they see. 
I may not always understand, but I like thinking that my eyes are blessed because they see. And I love Mark because I get a chance to see Jesus not just as God and not just as the master teacher, but I get to see him as the one who has the power to do anything. Especially giving sight to the blind so that he might see more clearly. And I want to think, do I see clearly? But Luke really has probably become my favorite of the four. And maybe as you read the Gospels in the future, you will read them differently. And that maybe you will see things a little differently as you read through them, especially as you read Luke. And I hope that as you read it, especially as you get to chapter 24, that you'll begin to recognize the importance of making sure that other people, not just our brothers and sisters in Christ, but people in the world have a chance to see Jesus differently because of you. And that by your words, by your attitudes, by your actions, the where you go, the things you participate in, and who you are, the people will see Jesus. And maybe that's going to be because that when you look at people, you're looking not through the eyes of Simon the Pharisee, but through the eyes of Jesus. And you're not looking through the eyes of the priest or the Levite, but you're looking through the eyes of the Good Samaritan. Or maybe you're like Simeon. And you have the opportunity for your eyes to see the salvation of the Lord. But if you do nothing else, I hope that beginning today and from this day forward, that you're going to make a concerted effort to spend more time in a fellowship meal with a brother and sister in Christ so that maybe you'll be able to see Jesus in them and that they can see Jesus in you. Thank you so much for your attention. I'm looking forward to preaching the lesson this morning. <laughs> Hopefully after the lesson, you're going to see God a little differently. <laughs> but I'm thankful for the privilege of being here. It's been such a blessing to me. And I'm very thankful for the hospitality and just the encouragement that you provided. And I look forward to our time in worship together.